Hi, I would love to share with you guys a few lessons I learned from prison. My name is Okoro Blessing in Kiroka and I'm popularly known as Blessing CEO. I'm a certified relationship therapist in Africa. <laughs> this is going to be a very interesting topic that a lot of people have been curious about. So I want you to get a seat. I want you to get your headset. If you have small jobs, please get it and sit down because I'm about to take you on a roller coaster. If you are an intelligent person, you're going to learn from this video. But if you're a foolish person, you're going to troll or many of you might not even have data to watch this video. But I urge you, it's a must watch because there are so many lessons and fun few facts in this video I'm about to spill. Number one, prisons are not for criminals only. They are also for victims of circumstances. When people go to prison, it doesn't mean that they did something or they are thieves. No, sometimes circumstances can land you in a place that you know nothing about. Just like Joseph in the Bible. <laughs> Remember, his brother sold him. One way or the other, he found himself in prison. And that's where he became the president. <laughs> I'm not trying to see I'm becoming a female president. I just want to tell you a few lessons I learned while I was in prison. First of all, blessing. How did you even get into prison? Because you look so pretty. You look so in intelligent. You're legit. What actually took you to prison? Yes. So I actually went to prison right in Lagos, Kiri Kiri Correctional Center. And um, I spent three weeks in prison. Even though I'm still looking this fresh, but I went to prison. <laughs> First of all, what took me to prison? I'm going to start from the beginning in as much as the case is in court, but I'm going to give you guys a little tip of how I got there. Because there is a misconception on the media. You know, when those bloggers want to tell stories, they write different types of concussion, you know, to feed you guys just for entertainment. But here I want to state the honest fact of exactly what happened, what transpired. For those of you who would learn so that you could learn something out of it. First of all, I'm a certified relationship therapist. I have my license. And most times I like to talk about trending issues because oftentimes people have to base their understanding when you can use other people as illustration. So oftentimes when celebrity stories break out or stories break out, I pick it as illustration to actually pass my message. That's what I've been doing on the media and that was how I got these famous. I'm a very factual woman. Unfortunately, in the society that we found ourselves, they say we are not supposed to say the truth. We are supposed to be constructive. We are supposed to paint the lies. We are supposed to make society feel good about themselves because they say a lot of people are not strong enough to take the truth. But like I always say, everybody is not meant for me. I have my audience. And my audience are the strong people who are strong enough to absorb the honest truth. Because it's only when you know the truth that you can be able to live a good and honest life without harming yourself. So a news broke out sometime in October where a woman burnt herself. We don't know what happened. We just saw a video when somebody was making a video from downstairs and saying, ah, this woman don't finally burn herself again. Ha, this woman has burnt herself. Oh, ha, this woman, this woman, you know. So when the news broke online, as usual, everybody started talking. We didn't even know this woman. This woman wasn't a celebrity per se. So it was just a random news of, you know, a young woman. So at that point, we don't even know the story that was behind the burning. We're just wondering, ah, what person could burn himself? There was no story yet. Until, you know, um, different narratives started coming out. Before the narrative started coming out, immediately that video broke out. Um, Daddy Freeze is my friend. Most times he always invites me to his live video to share my insights with his audience. So he invited me with other relationship therapists and other guests. We spoke our minds. Everybody had their opinion. I shared my story. I even spoke for over 45 minutes of how I left my previous marriage. And I was wondering what would make a woman want to hurt herself that much. Because burning yourself is a painful death. So what would make a woman want to hurt herself that much? And I made a statement out of the conversation I was having. I said, maybe she has always wanted to die. Because a lot of women will not leave what they have done or what they have sweat. Some women, you see them say, 
over my dead body will I leave this man? I don't suffer with him too much. That was where I was coming from. So that statement was born out of a long conversation. But trust the bloggers. They have a way of misinterpreting the narrative. They picked on that one second where I said, this woman has always wanted to die and started trending it. So it made me look like a bad person, as if I was inhuman, as if I just woke up, you know. And funny enough, I didn't know this person. I was just speaking generally, you know, trust the internet. Some said I was right, some said I was wrong, and it was trending. Meanwhile, to so quickly add, before the story broke out, I didn't know the man, I didn't know the woman. I have never heard of them in my entire life. They said the husband to this woman was a popular businessman. I didn't know him. I've never ever heard of him in my life before. Maybe because I was in Abuja, from Abuja to Calabar, from Calabar to Enugu, then from Enugu to Lagos. I always go to Lagos to visit, but I've never really lived in Lagos. I just relocated to Lagos when I opened my office officially in Lagos State. So when the news broke out, I didn't even know the both parties in question. Never heard of them before. I was talking about them like strangers. Then when I spoke and that video went viral, the family started dragging me. The brother to the late woman started writing stuff about me because you know on the media when you don't support people's plight they come against you i was you know responding to him and i remember making a live video telling him that let should give us a better memory of his late sister than just you know putting all these banters on the internet that was my advice to the younger brother i think he hit my advice and took down all the posts and started giving us beautiful memories of the late woman that was before the husband reached out to me for professional service. He said his own part of the story. The narrative was that he killed his wife. He pushed her into the fire. Nothing like that ever existed from the evidences that were shown. Unfortunately, I'm a relationship therapist. Or well, fortunately, I'm a relationship therapist and I see a lot of things that happen behind closed doors. So from there, there was nothing like that. It was just maybe, you know, when a family is grieving, it's always easy for you to put the blame on somebody else, you know. So I started speaking on this man's behalf because he was not really a very outspoken person. Unfortunately, Nigerians changed the narrative. Because a man was involved, automatically, Blessing was sleeping with this man before he lost his wife. Blessing is a side chick. I started getting dragged. But I'm so used to being dragged because I'm controversial. But I knew within myself that I didn't know these people from Adams. Maybe that was what was giving me the gods. Because if I had known these people from Adams, trust me, I'm smart enough not to come public. But I was doing this because I knew there was no strange attacks. There was no personal feelings. I I've never heard their name before. The narrative changed and the Nigerians began to drag. You know, instead of saying all different kind of stuff, as usual. So long as a man is involved and a woman is involved. A lot of Nigerians already have the narrative that once a man and a woman is involved, they have to be sex. So they already painted the picture that I was having something. In fact, I connived with the man. There was nothing they didn't see. I read it and I just laughed because the man and I know that we don't even, I don't even know who he is. I was only asking people, who is this guy? They said, this guy is famous. Who is he? I was calling my friends. Who is this guy be? They were telling me stories. I was like, really? I don't know him. I've never heard of the name before. Maybe because I'm not a Lagos G. <laughs> so welcome to Lagos. So the G started flying, flying, flying around, and the media started dragging. When the media started dragging, I decided to let the matter be. I kept quiet about it and said, okay, since um, the media wants to turn the narrative into something else, let me do my job privately and um, see how I can assist this man in my own way because I know a lot of things that have happened behind closed doors. So from that period, I kept quiet and went about my business. So one day, I got the WhatsApp message from a strange number. And when I opened the WhatsApp message, it was an invitation from the Nigerian police force, Banti Yaba. Immediately, I got the message. The person just sent me the letter without any word. I called the number. I said, who are you? He said, he's an IPO. His name is so so and so person. He's from Banti that I'm invited. That is a case that he would like my input. I said, fine. I wasn't in town as of that period. I told him as soon as I come into town, I am going to come see the police because the, the letter was very, very official and cordial and warm. I'm going to put the letter on this video. So I was not around. So the IPO kept calling me. I told him, don't worry. Once I come into town, I don't run from police. I'm a public figure and I've worked with the police before. So when I came into town, I called my lawyer and my personal assistant and we drove to Banti. When I got there, um, I realized that somebody had reported me at the homicide session. 
they gave me the petition that was written against me. The person accused me of, you know, conniving with the um, late woman's husband to kill her. You know, there were some very, very strong allegations. And I asked the police officer, this person that wrote this stuff, does this person understand that there's also an implication for false um, allegation that you're lying on somebody? Because I know I've never met these people before and I don't know them from Adams. He asked me to write my statement. After writing my statement, I've never met them before. I don't even know this man in question. And I don't even know this woman in question. Never met them before. The story was just an internet story. I dropped my own opinion. I wrote my statement and they granted me bail. And I left. So they gave us another date to come because the woman in question wasn't available the day I came. She's based in Abuja. So they called her. We fixed the general date and she agreed to the date. On that date, I came with my lawyer. Before I got to the police station on that very fateful day, the IPO was already calling me. Where are you, madam? The complainant has been here. Like, I told him, please, I'm sorry. I'm coming all the way from the island. And if you're coming from the island to the mainland, you should understand the hold up. I kept apologizing. He kept calling me. Where are you? I told him I'm on my way until I finally got to Banti. When I got to Banti, I apologized. The hold up, I was with my lawyer. And I asked, where's the complainant? Can we start? I even want to set my eyes on this person that is, you know, heaping this huge allegation on me and I've never met this person before. So we're still talking when a young man walked up to me. I said, good afternoon, ma. I said, good afternoon. He said, my name is Susan So. This case has been transferred to Abuja. I looked at the IPO and I asked him, why didn't you tell me the case has been transferred to Abuja? Why did you make me come all the way here? That was when I knew that money has exchanged hand. And there was a game plan to this. It was no longer a police case. It was now a case of drama, a script. So I sat. I sat down and allowed them play their drama. The police officer who walked up to me and said the matter was transferred to Abuja was nice. He was civil. He engaged me in a conversation while they were trying to transfer the file. I waited. And my lawyer asked him, why are you people transferring the case and why is Blessing still here? You guys can do your whole case transfer. Invite us when we come to Abuja. He appealed that we should wait. There are some certain documents I have to sign. I said, no problem. We spent almost the whole day at the police station that day. When they were done transferring the file, they took me to Ikeja, a police station. And that was where the second police officers told me I was under arrest. My lawyer said, for what? She's been granted bail. And she came to the police station. How are you arresting her in the police station? So, the police officer gave me another charge. Another petition was written to me by the complainant. This time, she had abandoned the first case of saying, I murdered, I was part of the people who murdered her sister with the, with the husband and all that. And she has switched to cyber bully and cyber stalking. <laughs> I now asked the police officers, what happened to the first case? I thought we were supposed to continue. They said, um, let me just write my statement. <laughs> I wrote my statement. After writing my statement, the police told me I was under arrest. <sighs> my lawyer was laughing. He said, why would you arrest her? You picked this woman from the police station, right? When she came to the police station, right? Why are you arresting her? Why not invite her the way you invited her before and she came? They said, it's order from above. I said, who gave you that order? Who is bridging my fundamental human right? You did not hold me down for allegation of murder and killing somebody. And you are holding me down for cyberbully. I don't understand. Because homicide session is more serious than this session you are taking me to. I don't understand. The police officers were getting a bit aggressive and I told my lawyer, it's fine. No problem. They detained me. To the next morning. The next morning, they took me straight to Abuja with Valley Jets Airline. We landed in Abuja at about 12 and we went straight to their office. Meanwhile, the complainant was already defaming me. I didn't know that while I was in Panti, you know, going upstairs, the IPO had videoed me from the back and given to the complainant to give to bloggers to post. He was already trending that I was arrested, I was locked up, I was jailed, my nash is leaking. She defamed me. I read all these things and I just ignored. When we got to Abuja, we got to the police station 
and they asked me to write another statement, which I did. Meanwhile, I had called my lawyers in Abuja and they were waiting for me. As soon as I landed Abuja in the police station, area 10 to be precise, my lawyers were there. So after writing my statement, that was where they invited the complainant. And that was where I saw her for the very first time in my life. So we seated on a round table. They needed her to explain to me directly what I did. She explained, she explained her grievances and said I insulted her. I insulted the family, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know what transpired. I wasn't there. And I also told her, you weren't also there when this incident happened. In as much as this person was your sister, you were not also there present. You were in Abuja. So everything you would have heard is also story the same way I have heard. Because you were in a witness. And at this point, you are not even in good terms with your late sister's husband. So you have not even heard about what actually transpired. She finished laying her grievance scenes, and I objected to it. I said, no, I didn't defame you. What I did on my page was ask you a question, and you picked offense. Good. The police officer said, okay, they have to grant me bail because they sure knew I didn't do anything. So they were trying to rush the conversation so that I didn't sleep in the station because at that point, my lawyers were ready to sue. So the police um, gave us another date to come and granted me bail. Before we left the gathering, I said to the IPO who was seated right beside me, I said, this woman seated right here does not want justice for her late sister. What she wants is clout. Those were my words to the police officer. The police officer said, how do I know? And I told the police officer, as we are seated here right now, this woman has taken picture of me and is going to paint a wrong narrative to the bloggers. He said, it's not possible. Nobody can snap you in the police station. Meanwhile, as I got into the police station, they collected my phones. I didn't have access to my phones because they said, when you're in the police station, you don't make calls. I said, fine, but this woman had access to her phones. I knew she had taken pictures of me because that is always when she was, what she wanted to prove. She needed to give bloggers this picture to prove that I have arrested Blessing. The police officer told me that it's not possible. I said, fine. They granted me bail and I left that same day back to Lagos. Two days later, I saw my picture online on Gist Lover where I was seated and the IP was seated beside me. This woman had given the bloggers my picture Right in the police station, she took me a picture beside the IPU. No, in as much as you might be laying some allegations against me, don't breach my fundamental human rights. You can't be accusing me of defaming you and cyberbullying you. Why you are actually the one cyberbullying me? I have never taken pictures of you before. I have never insulted you before. I have never snapped you one-on-one -on -one before. I have never recorded you before. Why are you the one bringing police, arresting me? and still recording me at the same time and defaming me in the minds of bloggers. That was what I kept wondering. How come this woman is using the law, yet she's still a clout? Choose one. If you go to the police, it simply means you trust the police enough to get you justice. Why are you clouting? Why are you taking pictures of me? Why are you declaring me a criminal online when I'm not a criminal? Police have not declared me a criminal. You laid an allegation against me. The police is still investigating. You are snapping me right in front of police officers and giving it to bloggers. I quickly called the police officer. Immediately, I saw my picture. The police officer said, oh, no, it's not possible. We are going to do something. We didn't do anything. I said, okay. Within that period, I felt ill because I slept in the police cell and mosquito had beaten me. So the next time they invited me to Abuja, I couldn't come. So I reached out to the police officers and sent them my doctor's report that I wasn't feeling too well. They actually um, sent their regards and chose another date. They gave me 20th to come. During that 20th, they gave me was after election, after the Xmas period. I appealed to them that, you know, we had traveled to the village, we had spent money, and the road is rough now. Why don't you fix a more suitable date? And I'm not financially buoyant because everything happened in Lagos and this woman took this case to Abuja. I have to fly myself, I have to feed myself, I have to put myself in the hotel, I have to sort some certain things out if I'm in Abuja. I'm not financially capable at that point in time. The police said, okay, we will choose another date. Meanwhile, when I saw that the police wasn't doing anything concerning the picture of me that was all over the internet, I reached out to my lawyer. And my lawyer said, we are going to sue for my fundamental human right. We actually sued the police and sued the woman in question for 50 million naira for breaching my fundamental human right. We actually served the police. We served the woman in question. And that was where the game changed. 
Immediately we sued the police and sued the woman. That was when police got angry. The IPO actually called my lawyer and was saying different types of stuff because we did not just serve the IPO. We served it directly to their boss. So he was upset. That was where the story changed. Immediately, they blanked me off. My lawyer had already told me, for you to sue police, you have to prepare because they will come for you. But I didn't know that coming from me was going to be this fabricated drama that they displayed on the internet. I said, I'm ready because you cannot watch another civilian breach my fundamental human. If it was police that snapped me, better. But a civilian like me cannot breach my fundamental human right and still be accusing me of defamation of character. I don't know the connection that she has or the money that has passed through different pockets. But no, you're not going to breach my fundamental human rights to my face. I'm enlightened enough to know when somebody is beginning to bully me. And that was what she was doing. So at that point, the police blanked me off. We tried to reach out to them to ask them when is the next date. They never said anything. On a fateful day, after about a week or two, a strange number called me and I peeked. He said, good afternoon, Mama. I have a letter from you from Ikoi High Court. I said, okay, where's your location? I told him, I thought, then I was in Ikeja. I told him to come to Ikeja. By the time the man had gotten to Ikeja, I had left Ikeja because it took him a while. Maybe he used bus or the Lagos hold up. So when he called me and told me he was in Ikeja, I apologized and told him, I'm so sorry. I have left Ikeja, but this is what I would do because I know that I have inconvenienced you. Pick a cab, I will pay for it. I gave him my office address to bring the letter to my office. I texted the office address to him. I waited for him in the office for over an hour or two. He didn't show up, so I went for another meeting. By the time he got to my office four hours later, I was not around. When he got to my office, he called me and said, Madam, I'm in your office. I said, oh, I have left the office. What took you so long? He said, hold up. I told him, okay, good. Give it to my receptionist or give it to my personal assistant. He will sign on my behalf. Then send me your account number. Let me send you the money for the transport fare. He said, no, that they said he has to give me the letter one-on-one. -on -one. Wow. I started wondering what kind of letter do they want to give me one-on-one. -on -one? I told him, okay, hold on. I called my personal assistant and said, what's going on? She said, ma, this man is holding camera. I don't know what he wants to do with the camera. I said, camera again? That was when I suspected that it might be coming from the complainant because she always likes to snap and to video to defame me online. That's her hobby. She enjoys it when they are dragging Mr. CEO on her behalf. But she doesn't know that for every time you take some actions, it also has implications. So I told the man that I'm not around, that he should come back some other time. And I also told the man that to get me on seat might be difficult because he says he stays on the mainland. I might be coming, you'll be going. And I have things that I'm doing. If you cannot drop it with my personal assistant or my receptionist, I will get my lawyer to come and pick it up from you. He said, okay. I called my lawyer and I sent the phone number to my lawyer and asked him, do you know this person? He called and said, yes, he's a believer in Ikoi High Court. He called the number and told the guy, this letter, I want you to bring it to me or can I come and pick it? She's my client. The guy said no, that they instructed him that he must give it to me one-on-one. -on -one. I started wondering, it got me bothered. Which letter do they have to give blessed CEO 101? Meanwhile, this guy hadn't told me anything the letter was about. I don't even know what was going on. I was blinded by the police. I didn't know what was going on as of then. And that's what I asked my lawyer, which kind of letter be this one where they won't give me? Where they know if you give another person. It got me scared.